Well, we're together again, and I feel good for the opportunity. Hope you do as well. We've been covering some tough subjects, ones that certainly are difficult to hear, <clears throat> let alone preach. Tonight's subject has to do with something that is very timely, has been for a long time, and is very beneficial to us as we seek to live in our culture. That is the subject of homosexuality. Let me say this. I do not, nor do members of the Churches of Christ, believe that homosexuals or those who practice homosexuality are bad people. That is to say, we don't think that, and I don't think, that we ought not to treat them with respect, that we ought not have a certain respect for the dignity of mankind, no matter who they may be. But certainly we want to let it be known that we do not agree with the lifestyle they choose to live, and we'll show you why tonight. Homosexuality, when we use that word, we mean a people who have sexual relationships with members of like genders. That is, a man involved in a sexual relationship with another man, or a woman involved in a sexual relationship with another woman. Let us look to the Bible very quickly to see what the Bible has to say concerning this matter. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 first. If you'll turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, I do hope you have your Bibles. Because we want to use them as we consider this subject and all subjects. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, read with me verse 9. Bible says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate. Now watch this phrase. Nor abusers of themselves with mankind. If we were to look that up in the Greek language, we would find that it has to do with the idea of homosexuality. Sodomites is a word that you would see there. They abuse themselves with mankind. Men abusing themselves with other men. Women abusing themselves with other women. Turn over to Romans chapter 1 and let us read carefully. <clears throat> Romans chapter 1. Beginning at verse 26. The Bible says, For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error which was meet. In both of these passages, we do not find God giving praise to the activity found therein. On the contrary, we find God giving a condemnation to the activities participated therein. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, it was an abuse of themselves with mankind. Here we have them leaving that which was natural and going to that which was against nature, men with men, women with women. This is a practice that plagues our society and many in our society and the world over are trying to defend it, are trying to say that we have good arguments, even biblical arguments, which we'll see, which cause us to believe that homosexuality is that which is okay with mankind and even more so okay in the eyes of God. And so we have these churches, quote unquote, that have allowed homosexuality to take place in the congregation. They are allowing their ministers and so on and so forth to be practicing homosexuals. And they bring up these arguments to argue for the condoned practice of homosexuality. What I intend to do tonight is to answer the arguments, at least some of them, for homosexuality. That's simply our topic. Arguments 
for homosexuality and the answers for them. We want to, at least in a, like we did last night with marriage, divorce, and remarriage, we want to, in some minute way, try to at least answer some of the major arguments that are used in our day and in the past days to deal with homosexuality. That being said, let us begin. Some have said gay people are gay because of a gay gene. It is still pontificated that there is a gay gene and that people are practicing homosexuals because in our genetic makeup we have a gene that causes us, or some people that is, causes them to be gay. In 1962, Michael Pritchard did a study of male homosexuals, and he found that there was a normal complement of XY chromosomes in every case, meaning that homosexuals don't have different chromosomes than straight men and straight women. They have the same amount of chromosomes that straight men and straight women have. In 1974, the America, American Psychiatric Associate voted to remove homosexuality from its list of mental illnesses. They determined that it cannot be classified with things like schizophrenia, bipolar, by being bipolar or such like, because it was not a mental is illness, which was an argument that they tried to use for it. In 1979, after a 10-year study, sex researchers Master and Johnson concluded that homosexuality for most persons is neither a physical or emotional illness, nor a genetic disorder. Rather, listen carefully, it is a learned behavior. This is 1979. Studying this, Dr. Jerry Bergman stated, quote, it is not understood exactly what learning produces sexual orientation, but because this behavior is learned, quite possibly it could be learned from other homosexuals, end quote, 1981. That is to say, in 1962, it was discovered that homosexual men and women had the same chromosomes that normal people have, that is, normal uh, practicing heterosexuals. In 1974, it was considered not to be a mental illness any longer. 1979, it was not a genetic disorder, not an emotional disorder, but it was said that it was a learned behavior, learned behavior also said in 1981. But probably the most important study that you never heard about took place on April 14th, 2003, about oh, a little over 10 years ago. It had been hyped up that the gay gene was going to be found, that there was a group known as the International Human Genome Consortium that was going to find, doing a grand study, to find the gay gene. It was all over the news. It was in all kinds of magazines. It was in the newspapers. The homosexual community saw it as a great triumph, whereby in just a little while, it would be proved forever that there would be a gay gene. One of the purposes of this human genome consortium was to identify all the approximately 20,000 to 25,000 genes in human DNA. That is, they wanted to find every gene in the makeup of man and give it an identity so that you would have 20,000, at the time they were thinking 20,000 to 25,000 genes, and each one of them would have a classification be given a name. For our purpose of our study, there's a lot of information that you can look up and find about that. For the purpose of our study, what we found out is that there was no such thing as a gay gene. They looked at every gene in man, and out of every gene that they found, they did not found, find a gene that made a man gay or a woman gay. 
You never heard any. You heard all about the hype going into it. But after that fateful day for homosexuality in April 14, 2003, you never heard anything else about it because it defeated their purpose. It was not found. But the media didn't tell you that. They didn't hype it up and say, oh, we didn't find it. It was quietly swept under the rug. And everybody continued to say that there was a gay gene. Friends, I'm here to tell you that science has shown that it does not exist. When we talk with our friends, when we look at the media, when we consider all these things, we need to be absolutely aware that this argument that there is a gay gene has been shown to be false and we can prove it through what they like to argue they love, science, just they don't love this part. Because it shows it does not exist. Argument defeated. Number two, especially in our days, it is argued that homosexuality and the ability to practice it therewith is a matter of civil rights. Why they tied into the March on Washington, Washington and all of the civil rights activities of the 1960s and so on and so forth. And they say, well, we, we, that was great, but we didn't go far enough. Those who are practicing homosexuals have not had their civil rights given to them, and they're still denied their civil rights. Well, civil rights. Well, the argument is this. Just as a person cannot help being black or white, Asian, or female or male, I cannot help being homosexual. We're born this way, and as such, we should be treated equally. Now, the argument is given that way, but it fails in terms of the law, and I'll tell you why in just a moment. When it comes to that argument, the law protects everyone's civil rights, at least it's supposed to. The law protects everyone's civil rights. A person who is a practicing homosexual, homosexual can walk into a store and buy anything he or she so chooses, just like a black person can, a white person can, just like a male or female can. They can do all these things that they can sit at any table in any restaurant. They can do all of these things that other people can do. They can get jobs. They cannot be discriminated because of certain jobs and so forth. They cannot be restricted from certain places that are public places. They have all those same rights. But what the law does, it does not restrict people from civil rights. What it does is it deprives people of certain behaviors. Let me show it to you. When you talk about behaviors, we move into a different realm. Every one of you sitting in here today is deprived, whether you be young or old, whether you be black, white, or whatever, whether you be male or female, every one of you is deprived from the behavior of child molestation. You can't just do that. You can't go and just get away with it. You cannot practice that behavior. Every one of us is kept away from rape. We are kept away from doing those things. It used to be that on the books, everybody was kept away from the behavior of sodomy. Friends, that goes for everybody. It deprives everybody of behaviors. What the law does, it says that this behavior will not be tolerated. Whether you're black, whether you're white, whether you're male, whether you're female, whether you're young, whether you're old, this behavior will not be tolerated. Now ask, tell me something. Can you tell a person is a homosexual simply by looking at them? Now, now don't go too far now. I know sometimes they got shirt tied up and you might have some other stuff going on. But I mean, if you just saw an individual, could you tell that that individual is a homosexual? Yes or no? You don't have to answer. The answer is no. You see a woman, you don't know if he's a homosexual. You see a man, you don't know if he's a, he's a homosexual. But what you have to have in order to tell it is a behavior. Just like a black person. You can tell when you look at that individual that he's black. In most cases, you can tell when you look at that individual that he's white. 
that that's a female in most cases, that that's a female, that that's a male, that that's an older female, that that's a younger female, that's an older man. That is something that is a trait. It is something that you see. But the way homosexuality is, it is a practice, which the law can restrict in that it is something that has to be done before I'm able to tell. Now you see a man coming in and he's twisting and switching and swinging keys and stuff all kind of ways. That's a practice. I can tell what that is. That's not to say that's what I'll do, but I'm just saying that is a practice that you can identify. It is the same way with homosexuality. It is not a biological makeup. We've already seen that. It is something that has to be practiced and the law has the right to restrict certain practices, not biological traits. The idea of it being a civil right is not a right. It is, as we look at it in that argument, it is not restricting their rights as traits go. It restricts behaviors, and we all have that. We'll talk more about that in just a moment. Number three, some argue we are born this way. Former Democratic presidential candidate and Vermont governor, Howard Dean, signed a bill legalizing civil unions for homosexuals in Vermont. In defending his actions, he commented the following, quote, the overwhelming evidence is that there is a very significant, substantial genetic component to it. From a religious point of view, if God had thought homosexuality is a sin, he would not have created gay people. Dean is not alone in his thinking. People say, God created me this way. Therefore, homosexuality must be okay because God made me this way. Now first, he got it wrong when he got to thinking about this genetic makeup because he said this in 2004. The, the study was done in 2003, so he was a year off and missed it. But as we look further, we now have 13 states, as I checked today, <clears throat> we now have 13 states, some are still in the process, why I say it that way, that have legalized homosexuality. That's 26% of our nation now allows homosexual unions, quote unquote, marriages. But I want to deal with this idea that Dean brings up and that so many hold, that God created homosexuals and therefore it's okay. Look at Psalm 139, verse 13. As you look at that text, you're going to find that God forms all children in the womb of the woman. The Bible says that he forms their inward parts, that he covers them in the womb. In the womb, he gives life. And with that life, he gives a soul, Psalm 139, verse 13. He gives them life. He gives them a soul. He's involved in the making of children as they form in the womb. Now we're talking about through providence and so forth. He's involved in that. But now turn over to Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 4. In this text, Moses is giving a retelling of the law before he dies and before the people go over into the land of Canaan. And one of the things he wants them to understand, <clears throat> the people of Israel to understand, Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 4, <clears throat> is that he is just and he is right. That is to say, God is fair. He rewards just. He rewards good with good. And he rewards evil with evil. Everybody gets a fair shake. Now he wants his people to know this before they go over into the land of Canaan. 
He wants us to know this. We can go all through the Bible and hear Bible writers say that God is just or something to the equivalent. God is just. He's fair. Everybody gets a fair shake. Yet the same God <clears throat> who makes all men, mankind who is involved in all in the making of every child that has ever graced the face of this earth. That same God says, as you saw in Romans chapter 1 and in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 9, that the pra those who practice homosexuality will be condemned. Wait a minute. You mean the God who is involved in making all mankind and who is just to all mankind says that any of the people of mankind that practice homosexuality will be condemned to a devil's hell. That's what he said. Well, if I'm born this way, that is, if I'm a, born, a person who is a homosexual and I'm born this way, that means that God made me this way. If he's involved in the making of every baby, that means that while I was in the womb and being formed, he somehow calls me to be gay. How then, if he calls me to be gay, how then would he be just in punishing me when he made me this way? How then could he turn around and say that I will go to hell when he's the one who made me this way? He wouldn't be. That's the fact of the matter. He wouldn't be because he'd have caused me to be something and then punish me for being what he calls me to be. So we got, we're on the horns of a dilemma here. Either he didn't make them this way, meaning he's just when he says I'll punish them for it, or he did make them this way, and then is unjust when he says he's punishing for it. You gotta choose one of the two, let me say this. The former is the correct one. Brethren, friends, the latter one is blasphemy. It is blasphemy. Why? Because it attacks the character of God. For a person to say, God made me this way, means that God caused them to be gay. Thus, he is unjust when he says, I'm going to send you to hell. Why? Because he'll send you to hell for something you can't help. He'll send you to hell for something that he did to you. That's not the God we serve. That's not the God of heaven. That's not the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He's always judged. Whether you're black, white, young, old, male, female, everybody gets a fair shake. For me to turn around and say, God made me this way is an attack on his character. And for any Christian to say that is an attack on his character. Because the fact of the matter is, God said, I, I was involved in making man. Thus, I know there's no such thing as a gay gene. I am a just God. I give everybody a chance to get right. Therefore, if you continue to practice homosexuality, do not fix it and get right. I will punish you. God didn't make anybody that way. We choose to do it. Next argument. Sodom and Gomorrah, some say, were punished for being inhospitable. Let me say that again. Sodom and Gomorrah were punished for being inhospitable. That's on our national televisions. You turn on the History Channel and you listen to their Bible people you know, they've got these doctors and all that kind of stuff they like to throw on there. They'll make that statement right there on the History Channel. It was for their being inhospitable. Well, I want you to turn over to Genesis 19. <clears throat> you see, biblically, homosexuality is not seen as a medical problem, but as a moral problem. That's biblically, that is. <clears throat> and because that is the case, <clears throat> people have gone and tried to sweeten up the perversion by trying to find ways around the text. So what they do, they come to Genesis 19, and they say, well, that, see, that, that, that 
Sodom and Gomorrah situation, that was really, they just weren't being hospitable. We're going to talk about it in just a moment. They, they really weren't being hospitable. <clears throat> and so I would like to examine the text and consider it. But I want you to notice this. Have you ever heard the word sodomite? Certainly you have. You know that word has been around for centuries. You know, sodomite was another word of just saying in, in ancient language. We don't say it much as more. It was a way of saying homosexual or a person who practiced homosexual. That's what the word was used for. Why did most of the world, round of the world, use that word for homosexuality if all it was was being inhospitable? How did it come to be equal to and mean the same thing as homosexuality or the practice of it when all it was was being inhospitable. Let's look at Genesis chapter 19. I want us to notice, we got a little time, let's take the text out. There came two angels, verse 1, to Sodom at even. Lot sat in the gate of Sodom, and Lot seeing them rose up to meet him, and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. He said, Behold now, my lords, turn in, I pray you, into your servant's house, and tarry all night, wash your feet, you shall rise up early, go on your ways. And they said, Nay, we will abide in the street all night. He pressed upon them, I want you to notice this adverb, greatly. This is a man who is begging, pleading, pressing upon them not to stay out in the streets. And they turned into him, entered into his house. He made them a feast, did bake unleavened bread, they did eat. But before they lay down, before they got good and comfortable, you know how it is after you eat, you get a little sleepy. Before they got a chance to get tucked in and good and sleep, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, compassed the house round, both old and young. Notice this next word. All the people from every quarter. I think sometimes we get to thinking, you have maybe 5, 10, 15 men standing out there. You got all the men from every quarter coming around Lot's house, however it was, and they are trying to get in unto these men. Lot called un they called unto Lot and said unto him, Where are the men which came into thee this night? Bring them out unto us that we may be hospitable to them. Now, let's pause for just a moment. All they really wanted was to be hospitable to these men. All these men coming out from every quarter, won't even let you get in the bed. All of them coming out from every quarter, young and old. You know, you got to be pretty bad for the old people trying to come out and do it too. All the old people, all the young people coming out, and they're trying to get these men. And all they really want to do is be hospitable to them. Friends, I want you to see something. That word no, and I'm going to show it to you, is used in the Bible sometimes for a, as a euphemism for sexual relations. Let me show it to you in the same book. Turn over to Genesis chapter 4. <clears throat> Look at Genesis chapter 4, verse 1. And Adam was hospitable to Eve, his wife. And in his being hospitable, she conceived and bare Cain and said, I've gotten a man from the Lord. Well, all he was trying to do is be hospitable. And somehow she got a child out of that. <laughs> that same word, no, is the same word that we try to come over here and use and try to say that's being inhospitable. Turn over to Matthew chapter 1. Give you some New Testament for it. Just so you see through the Bible how it's used. Look at Matthew chapter 1, and let's look down <clears throat> at verse 25. Jesus here, <clears throat> and was not hospitable to her, till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. No, that doesn't fit, does it? I was, knowing Joseph, he was hospitable to her the whole time. But the idea of being sexually involved with her, now that fit. He wasn't sexually involved with her until after she had had Jesus. There's a reason for that. But now come back to Genesis chapter 19. If all that meant was to be hospitable to him, why is it the case that what is going to follow is said? Look at verse 6. Lot went out of the door unto them, shut the door after him. And said, I pray you, brethren, do not so, watch this word, wickedly. Question, 
When has it ever been considered wicked to be hospitable? You ever have somebody, you bring somebody in your house, you're going to feed them a chicken dinner with some collard green cornbread, all that kind of stuff, and they say, you stop that now. You being hospitable, that's wicked. You ever had that happen? Why? Because that's ignorant. That doesn't make any sense. That doesn't make any sense. Why would, in verse 7, would he say, do not so wickedly? Then watch verse 8. But now I have two daughters which have not had a man be hospitable to them. Let me, I pray, I'm just using it the way they're trying to argue. Let me, I pray you, bring them out unto you and do unto them it is good in your eyes. Only unto these men do nothing, for therefore came they under the shadow of my roof. Now, as you look at this, what I'm going to ask the question is, why did he offer his daughters for them to be hospitable to? Why did he mention that they have not had a man be hospitable to them? You think in all of the area of Sodom and Gomorrah, Nobody, they've never seen a man who wanted to be hospitable to them. Friends, it just doesn't fit. But then we bring it into the way the Bible means it. Lot, we certainly don't understand why he would do this, I know that. But he offers his two daughters who have not been sexually involved with a man. And he says, you can use them as you would like to. Now as you go on, I'm going to show you how bad these men were. To show you further that this was more than just being inhospitable. Look at how it says. They said, verse 9, stand back. They said again, this one fellow came in a surgeon and he would need to be our judge. Now we will deal worse with thee than with them. They pressed sore upon the man, even lot, and came near to break the door. These guys are so much wanting to practice homosexuality on these men that they're ready to break the door down. Remember, you got young men and old men out there trying to break the door down to practice homosexuality. They want it that bad. Keep reading. As you look at the text, it says, the men that were inside the house put forth their hands, snatched light into the house, shut the door. They smote the men with blindness. Now, I want you to see something. If, you, if I were a practicing homosexual and I was out there in the streets trying to get a hold of these men, and I'm just trying to show you how bad it was, when you struck me with blindness, I think I'd go home. I think I'm done with this. It's not that serious. I can't see. And everybody else can't see. See, be one thing if I couldn't see and I say, hey, Paulo, you still over there? Yeah, man, you see something? No, I can't see. I'm going home. Something ain't right here. But they want it so bad. Look at verse 11 as we look at the rest of it. So that they wearied themselves to find the door. You mean to tell me you are so much involved in it that you struck blind and you're still trying to find the door to get these men. Friends, when we look at our text, we've seen that the word no means sexually involved. We've seen that Lot was offering his daughters for them to be sexually involved with. We've seen that he called them wickedly. He was begging these men that came down to stay in his house so it wouldn't be done unto them what he knew was going to do. He said, I kept them in my house so that you wouldn't get a hold to them. They said, if you don't get out of the way, we'll do worse with you. Now turn over to 2 Peter. <clears throat> As we look at our text, 2 Peter chapter 2, I want you to look at what the New Testament writer Peter had to say about the same account. Chapter 2, 2 Peter chapter 2, notice with me, verse 7. It says, delivered just lot, vexed, watch this, with the filthy conversation, King James, lascivious life, American standard, of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them in seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. Did you hear that word, those words, filthy conversation? When has the Bible ever called hospitable or that idea of being inhospitable filthy in the way that is used here? Did you see those words, unlawful deeds, as looked here? Now I want you to turn over to Leviticus chapter 20. As you look at Leviticus chapter 20, what you'll find is that Sodom and Gomorrah were punished because of the grievous sin of homosexuality. Jude would say so as well, you can read there. But I want you to see that their homosexuality 
violated God's moral law, and it was for that reason that we're going to consider with some other things. It was for that reason that they were in trouble. Look at Leviticus chapter 20 and verse 13, that God saw it so much he had to say it again later. Watch. If a man also lie with mankind, as he lieth with a woman, both of them hath committed an abomination, they shall surely be put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. God said, if you decide that you want to hug up and kiss up and be all up on a man and practice homosexual, homosexuality with a man, you were forfeiting your right to life. He says to a woman, if she is going to want to hug up and kiss up and shack up and do all the things with a woman that you would normally do with a man, she has forfeited her life. Why? Because homosexuality is an abomination, verse 13, before God Almighty. It is an abomination. I know I don't make many friends by saying this, but that's what the Bible says. It was so in Genesis. It was so in Leviticus. It was so in Judges. It was so all the way through the minor prophets. It was so at the time of Jesus. It was so at the time of the Paul. Of Paul. It's the so same today. Friends, anybody that wants to be involved in homosexuality is committing an abomination before God Almighty. And a just God has to punish it. Now, our last argument. Boy, y'all quiet tonight. Hope I'm not offending. But if I am, well, that's just how it goes. What I have heard homosexuals say <clears throat> is God just wants me to be happy. You heard that one? This can't be wrong because I'm happy. God just wants me to be happy. Here is old Job. Loving old Steve, he just wants them to be happy. Here's Mary, loving Jennifer, God just wants them to be happy. And I would argue that yes, he does want you to be happy. John chapter 10, verse 10, <clears throat> Jesus said, I've come that they might have life, that they might have it more abundantly. He wants them to be, he wants people to be happy now, he wants them to be happy eternally. But he also knows what's good for man and what will truly make a man happy. And let me tell you, sin ain't it. That's his entire point as he goes through the Bible. He's trying to keep man, at least in part, trying to keep man away from sin because sin will not make man happy. God wants man to be happy in the right things. I want to give you an example of somebody that I think would fit for our purpose tonight. Turn over to Hebrews chapter 11. <clears throat> We all know this is the great hall of fame, faith. <clears throat> but I think we ought to consider verses 24 and 25 very quickly of Hebrews chapter 11. The Bible says, by faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Now watch this. Choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin, for a season. Sin had pleasure in it. Sin certainly could have been considered to make folks happy. But rather than do that, Moses chose to be with the people of God than to enjoy those pleasures for even a short people point of time. Now, let me illustrate this, and I think you'll get it. As we get this idea, God just wants me to be happy. Did you know some people enjoy murdering people? They do. Get a kick out of it. Let it. Let's say it was the case that I was one of those. I like to exercise. You know what, Brock? You know what would help me exercise? Man? If I could just go, y'all got a little shed around him, got some tools in it. Let me go out there and just get an ax. Let me come back in and see how fast you can run from me as I get an ax. That, that would make me happy. As I begin to chase you around this building, I would exercise good, have all kind of fun. You would scream a little bit. Throw that axe at you, you duck. That'd be fun, boy. We just we would be happy with that. How many of you would want to go for that? Wouldn't want like wouldn't like that, would you? But that would make me happy. Why can't I do it? Like people like murdering little kids. That makes them happy. God just wants them to be happy. Let them murder. Give them your child. Let them murder yours. 
What about the person who likes to steal? Oh, that just makes them so happy. Knock off a Brink's truck, steal your money off the internet. That, got, that just makes them happy. Let them take your money. You go home tonight, bank account at zero. You just say, well, that just made old so-and-so happy. I just let him get away with it. What about the person who likes to lie? He comes to your face, tells you a bold face light right to your face. You say, well, lying just makes him so happy. Let him just keep on doing it. And then he can tell me a lie and tell you a lie. Nobody say anything to him. Let him just lie. Why? Why would we say, we, no, you can't murder people even though it makes you happy. That's not good. You got to stop it. You can't steal. That, even though that makes you happy, you got to stop it. You can't over here tell lies and put, choose your poison. You got to stop it. But come to homosexuality, God just wants me to be happy. Let me keep on doing it. If it won't work there, why does it work here? If God wants me to be happy here, why can't he let me be happy murdering people? Why can't he let me be happy stealing? Why can't he let me be happy telling lies? Because it is the case, friend, that God does want me to be happy. But if what makes me happy is contrary to God's word, he expects me to give that up. That's Hebrews 11, 24 and 25. Moses could have gone right over there and laid up with Pharaoh and got in all that sin. And I'm sure he would have had a degree of happiness. But that wouldn't have made God happy. And so he said, I will not do that. I refuse to do that. I'd rather be with the people of God and suffer with the people of God than to make my God unhappy by doing what I think is happy. It's the same thing with homosexuality. If I get happy being a man with a man, I got to stop it. If I want to make God happy. If I'm a woman, then I'm happy with another woman. I got to stop it. If I want to make God happy. Now I can stay happy and go straight to hell. Y'all don't want me to say it like that, but I got to. I can stay happy killing folks and go to hell. I can stay happy stealing people's money and go to hell. I can stay happy lying and go to hell. I can stay happy in homosexuality, go straight to hell the same way as the murder. Friend, that argument does not work. Neighbor, it just won't do it. We come up with all kind of arguments to get around what the Bible says. The Bible says homosexuality is a sin for which a man and a woman will answer if they continue. Not too many amens. I know it. That's all right. I'm, I'm used to it. That's okay. You ain't gonna hurt my feelings. Let me tell you something. I ain't getting preaching to make folks happy. I got him preaching to preach the word of God. If that makes you happy, so be it. But let me say this. You might be listening to this right now and saying, that's a mean fella. No. I just want you to know what the Bible says. Let me show you the God we have. <clears throat> the God we serve is a God who is a forgiving God. The God we serve says, you can do anything that you would have liked to have done. You could have killed somebody. You could have molested children. Oh, that's a bad one. You could have stolen money. You could be practicing homosexuality. God says, so long as you are willing to give that up and to come to me in the way that I prescribe, I will save you. And I will forgive you. And you will be my child. He says in Hebrews chapter 8, <clears throat> What he said in Jeremiah chapter 31, their sins and their iniquity will I remember no more. You mean to tell me you could be practicing homosexuality right now and God on the day of judgment never bring that up against you? That's what I'm telling you. So long as you are willing to repent of that, change your mind about it, be baptized for the remission of your sins, be added to the church of Christ, be faithful that in, God says you will never have that brought up again. Same with the murderer. Same with a liar, same with a person who was a thief. As we talk about homosexuality, so long as you are willing to give it up, God says on the day of judgment, you will not have to answer for it. That's the God we serve. He is a forgiving God. He doesn't want you to go to hell. He's just, meaning if you continue in that sin, you do have to. He doesn't want you to. First Timothy chapter 2, verse 4. <clears throat> At uh, 1 Peter chapter 3, uh, 2 Peter 3, 9, he doesn't want anybody to be lost. He wants you to be saved. But in being just, he has to reward wickedness with punishment. He has to reward that which is good with a reward of goodness. He cannot flip and flop on those and remain just. 
But he wants you to be saved. I want you to be saved. We want you to be saved. If you'd be willing to give it up. Maybe you're a Christian here tonight. And you're struggling with something else. Let me say to you. The same God that will save the homosexual, homosexual will save you. If you'd be willing to give it up and to come home to him. Why will you die? The writer would ask <clears throat> at one time. We want to ask that same question. Why will you die when you've got such a righteous, loving God willing to save you? Why not come to him, be his, faithfully serving as we stand and sing? Oh.